so that there is a great heterogeneity. I lost the macro, no? There is a great heterogeneity at the regional scale, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you, you see the arrow up there? Yeah. Okay, so we use it. There is a great heterogeneity at the regional scale due to topography, for example, uh, different slopes of different mountains will not experience the same uh, climate conditions. But we are mostly interested of, of what is happening at the level of the organism, like at the local scale or even thinner scale, because this is where our uh, living species are, are, uh, are living, are occurring. And uh, it could be different uh, if you compare the tree scale level, for example, these species that are up there into the tree compared to those species that are lower on the ground uh, in the understory. We focus uh, in particular on this. So it's not moving. Yes. Okay. We focus in particular on this local scale. Uh, and we need to characterize the conditions at this, scale, at this scale, which is really pertinent for these organisms. And then we have this framework, uh, and this is actually what is going to happen for my presentation is to show you how we apply this mechanistic framework that we call biophysical ecology. It's mechanistic because uh, contrary to uh, statistical approaches, we know exactly what we put into the model. We may fail at the end, but because of the mechanistic approach, uh, we can go back to the mechanisms that we include into the, into the model and see where we and why we fail exactly. This framework uh, articulates different disciplines and it starts uh, basically from uh, a given amplitude of warming, for example, that's uh, the, the, the will here about environmental change. And our aim is to predict the response of the ectotherm of the insect to uh, this amplitude of warming. We go through several steps. The first step is to understand how much of the warming is transferred into the uh, local macrohabitat of the insect. And then we predict the microclimatic conditions that really the insect is experiencing. And from here, we can apply biophysical uh, models that allows us to compute heat transfers between the organisms and the environment to predict the body temperature of the insect. And this is the temperature that, that we think is pertinent if you want to uh, to predict physiological processes, for example, that are dependent on temperature. Then you can articulate the system with a formal biology approaches, like uh, typically uh, a measurement about a thermal tolerance of the species, and then compare thermal tolerance thresholds with body temperature patterns and see where and when the species is close to the limit, physiological limit. And this uh, prediction of physiological limit is actually what we aim uh, to achieve uh, in terms of response to climate change. That's the whole, uh, the whole framework. And actually, uh, we are not inventing uh, this framework. This framework is based on huge work from the 60s, 70s, and 80s from Warren Porter, and more recently from Michael Kierney, and many other authors, uh, Brian Elmuth, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, now we are trying to apply uh, as much as we can to insects. It's all connected. <laughs> there is one problem when we start to apply this framework is about spatial scaling, at which spatial scale uh, we need to, to work on. One way to think about that, uh, especially for insects that can be really, really small, or I should say arthropods, we have also spider mites uh, in the picture. Uh, one way to think about that very simply is uh, to, uh, to apply this uh, very, uh, very simple, uh, let's say, framework. The idea was to say, okay, humans, us as, us as human, uh, we decided that a limit between micro and meso scale is about 100 meters, and meso to macro scale is about 200 kilometers. These numbers can change in the literature, right? It doesn't really matter for today. And then if you uh, calculate the ratio between these uh, different thresholds and the size, average size of the human, and then you apply this ratio to these uh, different body, body size uh, organisms, then you get these predictions that uh, gives you, these numbers are in meters, that gives you 
actually the idea of at which scale you have to focus on if you work on a very small spider mites, for example, or larger aphids or even larger organisms. And you see that for aphids, which is probably the most common size for insects that you are working on, you have to go down to 10 centimeters if you want to focus on this macroclimate scale. And it can be even one centimeter scale for, uh, for very small spider mites. This is quite important because otherwise we know that about half of the species in the world overall uh, uh, is uh, below uh, this size of five millimeters. So this is what we, uh, what we call fine scale macroclimates to really uh, sort of put the emphasis on the fact that uh, we are working at very small uh, scales. Yeah. Okay, so what do we have as such small scale? It's mostly surfaces, surface temperatures, and very, very small uh, insects will be uh, greatly influenced by the temperature of the surface, and I will come back to this later. Um, here is really a, a, a snapshot, a picture, an uh, infrared picture taken uh, during the winter. Uh, it's not something I did, it's something I took from the literature. And uh, you see the numbers are the temperatures in Celsius of different surfaces in this, uh, in this picture. And depending, you see, uh, depending on the orientation of the solar radiation, which is the heater in this picture, uh, you will get very different temperature patterns. And, and a small insect that would be living at the surface of the, of the bark of, the, of this tree will experience 45 degrees Celsius while in the air we are at 12 degrees Celsius. And you see a large variation from four to minus two degrees in the shade uh, on the ground, and a large variation in surface temperatures in this landscape. And actually this range is so big that it reflects basically the range of mean temperature you can get over the world, basically, if you accept the poles, right? So it's a huge variation in temperature. And two questions are popping up immediately is, First is how small organisms and insects should be to exploit these temperature patterns potentially, and to what extent this heterogeneity can, uh, can be driving for more adaptations uh, for, uh, for insects that are living in this thermal landscape. To tackle these questions, we have, uh, we have a favorite model, of course, and our favorite model is the leaf microclimate. Why the leaf microclimate? There is a high biodiversity that is living in the philosphere, uh, but most importantly, uh, the leaf itself is already a filter of environmental conditions. The leaf is capable of transpiring and uh, receiving radiations, and then uh, we have a, a living organism that is creating a new macroclimate for insects that are living at the surface of the leaf. And what is really interesting is that this filter, of course, when an herbivore is attacking the leaf, this filter will be modified by the activity of the insect. And we will see that this can generate feedback effects at the macroclimatic scale. Just to illustrate a little bit what, uh, so I will mostly talk about temperature, but of course there is not only temperature in the world, but we focus on that aspect for the moment. And uh, here is an illustration of, uh, of a leaf temperature pattern uh, that we measure. You see that leaf temperature can be uh, warmer than ambient atmospheric conditions. Atmosphere uh, is in black and leaf temperature here in red. And you see on a daily basis that leaf temperature can be warmer than ambient and even colder during the night, uh, depending on the conditions. So this leaf temperature can deviate from ambient by several degrees and sometimes up to 15, 20 degrees, depending on the plant species. Another way of looking at the framework, a mechanistic framework I showed before is this really uh, schematic uh, view of what we do at, uh, at our institute. The first step is to uh, see, to characterize this leaf microclimate depending on the weather and climatic conditions. And then once we have characterized this microclimate, uh, we look at the effect, at the interaction between this leaf temperature and the plant herbivore interactions. We are here. And most importantly, as I said, the feedback effect that this herbivore can have on its own microclimate, generating novel microclimate at the leaf surface. And uh, we are uh, studying how these uh, 
Another macroclimate is capable, capable of driving the thermal adaptations uh, of a species at the community level. And then a final, sorry, a final step uh, will be to use this uh, framework to estimate the vulnerability, to assess the vulnerability of these insects to uh, heat waves, to extreme events. This schematic is, uh, of course, is reflecting a little bit this framework, mechanistic framework that I showed uh, before. So I will present uh, how we apply this framework uh, to this system. So yeah, go back. The first step is that uh, we, we applied this framework to a single species and uh, we, we, got, we applied uh, what we can call an inductive approach there. We really wanted to see something happening. So we, uh, we targeted a species for which uh, there is obviously modification of the plant system, of the plant tissues by the uh, insect herbivore. So this is a kind of extreme scenario of plant modifications. And we can find this using this leaf miner, uh, a leaf miner. So the caterpillar is living inside the plant tissues. It's uh, attacking the apple. And uh, you see here, for example, the mine uh, seen from the top. And here is a caterpillar inside uh, the plant tissues. What we did is that first we uh, characterize the modification that the insect is uh, generating to plant tissues, and then to be able to uh, compute the macroclimate within a mine. So predicting the temperature of a mine using a biophysical modeling approach. And uh, to see, um, and we did that also across the ontogeny of the leaf miner, which is developing uh, gradually. And then uh, we, uh, we uh, established the relationship between thermal tolerance and the macroclimate within the mine. Just few words about the life cycle of this uh, particular species. So you have a female, uh, it's a microlepidoptera, very small species. The female is laying an egg at the, uh, at the lower surface of the apple leaf. And then uh, the first three larval stages are happening inside the leaf tissues. And at that stage, uh, the larva is really a sap feeder. And we don't see apparently any obvious modification of the plant tissue at that stage. It's only at the fourth and fifth larval stage here that we start to see these white patches appearing that you see from outside and you see also here from inside. And actually, uh, these white patches that we call feeding windows uh, correspond to where the chlorophyll containing plant tissues has been fed by the caterpillar and only remain, sorry, only remain the epidermis of uh, the leaf. And of course, uh, the uh, surface occupied by these uh, feeding windows is increasing as the caterpillar continues to feed. And you see different trajectory. It's like a sigmoid because the fourth larval stage is feeding at a rate a bit lower than the fifth larval stage. Finally, the name for stage also occur, uh, occurs within the mine and then uh, the, uh, the moth emerge from the mine later on. The first question was, how this mine is working from a biophysical point of view. Here you have a schematic cross section of the mine with the upper uh, leaf surface, the lower leaf surface, and in apple, the stomata occurs there at the lower, lower surface. And you have the mine space with a thinning window and a green patch here. Of course, a mine is receiving, uh, like any object, uh, is receiving a radiation from the environment and it's also uh, absorbing and emitting thermal infrared radiations. It's an important component in any heat budget uh, of organisms. You have to consider also the amount of energy that is exchanged with ambient air uh, via sensible heat, so it's convection and conduction processes due to boundary layer effects. In this system, we also have a sensible heat exchange via uh, free convection between the mine atmosphere and the adjacent leaf tissues that are still intact. And then importantly, we have a loss of latent heat during evapotranspiration across the stomata. And uh, here, what is interesting is that stomata are uh, reacting to many different environmental parameters, a bunch of parameters actually. And here in this system for the moment, we consider the response of stomata to humidity, the temperature of the system and radiation level. In this picture, uh, we started uh, with the uh, most obvious modification, which corresponds to uh, the optical uh, properties of the mine surface. Uh, it's obvious because there are white patches. So we supposed that 
uh, these white patches uh, feeding windows should modify the ability of the surface to absorb incoming energy. You measure that by uh, measuring the absorbance. Absorbance is zero when all incoming radiation are either transmitted or reflected. And it's, it equals one when all incoming energy is absorbed by the system, contributing to the temperature of the system. Here we measured these absorbance value as function of the wavelength. And you see for intact leaf tissues that classic for uh, typical for a sea free plant, they absorb much uh, in the visible wavelength and, uh, and almost nothing in the near infrared range of the radiation. And for the mine uh, surface, we got something very different with much lower absorbance in the visible range and much higher absorbance in the near infrared range. This is what we call the physical modification here illustrated for the last larval stage. And we will see that this contributes uh, to, uh, to a warming uh, within the mine. Another modification uh, is occurring at the underside of the leaf of the system is a physiological modification and relates to the stomatal behavior in this system. Uh, as I say, stomata are re responding to a bunch of environmental parameters. Here, for example, stomatal conductance as function of radiation level of irradiance. So stomatal conductance is proportional to the opening level of the stomata, right? And we see that as you increase radiation level for uh, intact leaf tissues, you get a very typical response for seafood plants with increasing, uh, with opening level that is increasing up to saturation at some point. And this is not something we obtain for the mine surface. Uh, by contrast, even if um, a stomata started to open at low to moderate radiation level, then we see a stomatal closure, gradual stomatal closure as we continue to increase radiation. Such that at the end, at high radiation level, like under full sun, for example, you see a large difference here between intact leaf tissues and mine uh, surface for which stomata are almost entirely closed. Okay, these properties, we measured them all across the ontogeny of the leaf miner from the very early stages down to the nymphal stage. And not surprisingly, we found that actually eggs and the first three level stages do, do not influence stomatal behavior. Here, for example, the maximum stomatal conductance that is pretty much uh, equal to uh, intact leaf tissues. And it's decreasing gradually across the ontogeny of the system. The same for absorbance value uh, for egg and first three level stages. It's pretty much the same than uh, intact leaf tissues. And uh, absorbance in the visible is decreasing gradually across ontogeny. And uh, in the near infrared, it's increasing gradually uh, up to the nymphal stage. So these are, uh, for us, parameters that we use to feed a biophysical model, uh, which, is, uh, which are equations of heat transfer. Uh, to allow us to compute the temperature within the mine according to the environmental parameters across the ontogeny of the system. I will uh, stay simple, and this is here just an example of what kind of, of uh, predictions you can have from this kind of model. If you run this model uh, uh, with exactly the same conditions for all stages with like ambient hair uh, set at 25, 25 degrees, you have predictions here of the temperature within the mine as function of radiation level. Not surprisingly, uh, they are all increasing in temperature as you increase the amount of radiations because you are, uh, you are giving more energy to each system, despite ambient air is still the same at 25 degrees. But the rate of uh, warming within the mine is much higher at the nymphal and fifth level stage compared to the, fourth uh, the early stages. And such that under full sun, you have a difference of about eight degrees between early stages and, uh, and late stages for the, for the leaf miner, even if uh, temperature in the air is exactly the same due to the higher absorbance in the near infrared and also due to the stomatal closure in the system that is occurring during late stages. So we wondered if uh, uh, thermal limits uh, can be different across uh, these uh, stages. And what we did, we applied a very uh, typical standard uh, protocol to measure the upper level temperature of each stage in this uh, leaf miner system. And here you have 
uh, the uh, the percent survival for each group, each point is a group of individuals, and uh, survival within this group as function of the experimental temperature. What we obtain is that eggs and fourth larval stage have a, a 50 percent uh, threshold uh, level uh, temperature at about uh, 38, 39 degrees, while fifth and ninth stage have a much higher upper uh, limit. And there is actually an increase of about seven degrees across the ontogeny in this uh, in this upper level temperature. So now, if you uh, sit down and think about that, and if I have a question according to you and these informations, uh, what is the stage that is most at risk in this leaf minor system under warming? And if you look only at the macroclimate school, I would say, and just forget about the thermal biology. Then the answer is that the nymph is more at risk because it's already living in a much warmer macro environment compared to the early stages. And then if I ask now uh, the same question, but forget about macroclimate and just look at thermal biology, then the answer is totally the opposite because nymphal stages uh, are much more resistant to heat and therefore early stages will be more at risk under warming. So you see that depending on the school, on the discipline, you can have totally opposite uh, predictions. Of course, what I, the message here is that we need both, and we need to include both into, uh, into the same framework. Look here we are, this framework exists, and it's again quite simple. It consists in computing the warming tolerance of the different stages or different species. What is warming tolerance? It's uh, the uh, difference, it's only a difference between the, uh, the threshold, so the thermal limit, and the environmental temperature. So it's just a subtraction, right? It's really, uh, really simple. What people are doing up to now is mostly to use air temperature as a proxy of what these insects are experiencing. This is what you call the naive approach of computing the warming tolerance. So we started uh, with the same approach. And this is what you get there. So these are uh, predictions from the biophysical model uh, that is computing uh, the temperature within the mine depending on the microclimate. So I will probably better say atmospheric temperature. And here you have the warming, warming tolerance, which is actually the difference uh, between this uh, environmental temperature, atmospheric temperature, and uh, the, uh, the tolerance threshold of the, uh, each stage. Sorry. Each stage has a different uh, color here. And of course, because you, uh, you make this difference between uh, level threshold and air temperature, each stage is crossing the dangerous line, the zero line of warming tolerance below which actually the environmental temperature is already higher than the threshold of the species. And uh, they all cross this zero line at different temperatures that corresponds to their thermal limit. You see that the naive approach is generating warm tolerance that are quite, quite comfortable actually during uh, a, a large range of temperatures and the dangerous conditions are occurring starting at 37, 38 degrees in the air. These are model simulations uh, assuming that the mine system is in full cell, right? The point here is that it's not air temperature that we need to include, but uh, by contrast, but um, uh, the temperature within the mine, so the macroclimate temperature. So we did exactly the same, but using macroclimate temperature within the mine, this is what you call the well-informed warming tolerance. And the lines here are the predictions you can have. You see something very different. First thing is that all the lines for each stage are actually basically the same, meaning that all stages are crossing the dangerous uh, threshold at the same temperature. And this temperature uh, actually is very low, is at about 31, 32 degrees, which is at least seven degrees lower than what we predicted using the naive approach. So it's a large difference. And the conclusion there was that surprisingly, finally, despite the large differences in thermal limits and in macroclimatic conditions across the different stages, finally, all these life stages are equally and they are all susceptible to ambient warming. Okay, that was for this leaf miner. As, as I said, uh, a very particular uh, model 
uh, that can be seen as an extreme scenario of plant modifications. So now we wanted to move out of the mine system and see what it's, what's happening at the leaf surface and if we can apply exactly the same uh, conceptual framework and, uh, and see if different species can have uh, very different warming tolerance uh, depending on the effect they can have on the leaf system. So we are more now reaching the community scale level in this system. So since we are now at the leaf surface, there is one important point uh, which relates to the body size of the organisms. And uh, we have to consider the body size of the different species according to the size of the boundary layer at the leaf surface. This boundary layer is, uh, you probably know that, is this a thin layer of air that is relatively still at any kind of surface. It's not, uh, it's not particular to a leaf surface. And uh, conceptually, we wonder to, well, conceptually, we know that a very small, teeny insect that will be uh, largely embedded into this leaf boundary layer will have a heat budget that will be mostly driven by conduction processes with the surface. In other words, we expect to see the body of these small organisms to uh, equal the leaf surface temperature. By contrast, a large uh, body at the surface of the leaf will uh, jump out of the leaf boundary layer and will be probably much less dependent on leaf surface temperature patterns because the heat budget in that case will be mostly driven by convection processes with the air and or by radiative uh, heat transfers. So we did a, a, a pre kind of preliminary study actually to investigate if we can find in a community of arthropods living on a single plant, if we can find uh, some, somehow the uh, body size uh, threshold that separates uh, these two uh, modalities between con conduction and convection radiation. We did that on a system that we, on a subapin uh, system actually in the US with uh, my American colleagues, Arthur and Michael. And basically what we did is, uh, it was quite amazing actually, or funny, I will say, is uh, the methodology consisted very simply in working across the field with infrared cameras. And uh, thanks to these infrared cameras, at the same time, you get uh, the body temperature of the insect, for example, here for a grasshopper, and the temperature of the leaf surface around this insect. That's really practical. At the same time, we had data loggers, of course, to uh, survey and collect environmental data. And basically what we found is that uh, we got this uh, very clear relationship between body temperature of different insects and a leaf uh, surface temperature patterns. But if you look at the very details of this relationship, and, and I think you understood now that I'm looking at very fine details in all this stuff, you see that uh, leaf temperature is somehow setting the minimum body temperature you can get for this insect. But if you look at uh, the maximum temperature you can have for these insects, there is much more variability. So what we did at the same time of the infrared picture is that we collected the insect, measured body size, and did this relationship between the difference in temperature between the body of the insect and leaf surface as function of the body size of the, of the, of the insect, of the arthropods. And what we saw is that uh, as expected, very small organisms will have a temperature very close to a leaf surface temperature. And then when you start to increase body size of the organisms, uh, you start to see an increase in, in this temperature excess. So the body of the insect is getting warmer and warmer. And at some point, uh, we see uh, uh, this relationship does not hold anymore. So this is a lowest, uh, a lowest uh, smoother here that you see. Uh, this relationship is not holding anymore. And we think that this actually uh, corresponds to the body size at which we can separate the two uh, systems between small insects that are influenced by conduction processes here and those insects that are influenced by atmospheric uh, conditions. One point uh, that is amazing here is that the, uh, the metric for body size, sorry, that was, um, that was mostly pertinent here is body height. Uh, it is, uh, which is not very usual uh, for measuring when we measure body size of insects. And actually body length and body width were not accurate enough to predict this relationship. And this is because uh, body height of the insect relates directly 
to the uh, body, the thickness of the leaf boundary layer. This is the direct link here. So we know that you have to go down to very small organisms below like uh, two and a half or three millimeters in body height uh, to uh, work with insects for which you know they will be influenced by leaf surface temperature patterns. So we came back to Europe and to our favorite system, which is uh, still the apple system and its large cohort of uh, herbivores that are attacking this, uh, this uh, apple, especially in orchards. And uh, based on this, uh, on this knowledge about body size, uh, we uh, decided to focus on uh, only on the smallest creatures that you can find at the leaf surface in, uh, on Apple to be sure that these organisms will be influenced by these leaf surface temperature patterns. That's the point, uh, first point. And the second point at this community level, we also focused on species that do not destroy the integrity of the leaf system. That's to say, exit all the caterpillars that are modifying the shape and the size of the leaf and inducing dryness of uh, borders uh, when they attack and showing uh, the leaf system. Mostly because it's really difficult in a biophysical model uh, to introduce a leaf that is changing in size and shape uh, because this has an effect on temperature, of course. So we ended up with this uh, group of, uh, of six species and we see again the leaf miner. And we started by characterizing the effect of these different species on the, uh, on the leaf system, on the leaf gas exchange. For example, photosynthesis here, you have uh, intact photosynthesis of intact leaf tissues here in gray. And uh, I have to watch the time. And uh, you see that some species can increase photosynthesis. This is uh, known for aphids in particular, while others uh, are reducing photosynthetic rate. This is known also for spider mites. And uh, what is important here is that when there is a modification of photosynthesis, there is inevitably a modification of the stomatal behavior and transpiration rate. And this is where we are reaching very uh, important point in our conceptual uh, development actually of the system is that uh, the hypothesis was uh, that any, any species that is inducing uh, a reduction in the leaf transpiration rate, like going this way, will inevitably uh, um, induce a warming up of the leaf surface temperature. By contrast, any species that is inducing an increase in the leaf transpiration rate will also generate a cooling down of the leaf surface temperature. And what we expected to see is that these species on the left of the uh, schematic should have an upper level limit a bit higher than those species that will be there uh, on the right. So what we did is that we, uh, for each species, we measured their effect on the leaf, uh, leaf surface temperature patterns. At the same time, their effect on leaf transpiration and also their upper level limit using exactly the same protocol than before. Um, and this is what we got uh, actually with a relationship, a clear relationship that is following exactly what we expected with these aphids here on the left, on the right, sorry, of the picture that has inducing an increase in leaf transpiration and living in a cooler, uh, in cooler uh, macroclimate compared to those species, mostly spider mats that are inducing a reduction in leaf transpiration. And uh, we got also, uh, uh, these predictions were reinforced by this measurement of leaf temperature excess, which is quite high for spider mites because they are inducing uh, somehow uh, probably a closure of the stomata or uh, uh, by killing the cells, they are also uh, inducing a drying uh, locally of the cells. Uh, mechanisms are not entirely clear there. And by contrast, these aphids that are living almost close to uh, leaf surface temperature, uh, uh, intact leaf surface temperature, I would say. The, the temperature excess here is very small, less than two degrees. So thanks to this relationship, uh, we wonder if uh, we can predict the warming tolerance of these species, especially during uh, heat waves. So again, we uh, got back to biophysical modelings and measuring all the parameters that we need for each different species uh, to fit the model. That's why it took a long time actually to do this study. And uh, thanks to modeling, we were able to compute here, for example, the leaf temperature excess 
when uh, it is attacked by each species as function of the least trans transpiration rate. What we see is that during heat wave events, so extreme conditions, these uh, spider mites, for example, are living at about 10 degrees above, uh, above ambient air, uh, while these aphids are living at about six degrees above ambient air during this heat wave. So a big, uh, a big warming of the leaf surface. The uh, advantage of this modeling approach was also that we were able to derive a sort of uh, lethal air temperature threshold at the community scale. That's to say, the temperature in the air that will induce a warming of the local microclimate and at the same time uh, lead to, uh, uh, to mortality of half of the species in your own community. And we found that this uh, community lethal air temperature is as low as 33 degrees which is actually a temperature where you can get quite frequently uh, uh, in France, in our area. So again, uh, this biophysical modeling was uh, developed under the most extreme conditions, that to say, by considering the leaves under full sun. And what is important here is that these arthropods seems to be adapted to the microclimate that they induce, but uh, the heat waves seem to challenge these formal adaptations. So again, we, uh, we computed the uh, warming tolerance for each of the species, exactly the same conceptual approach than before. So using this biophysical model, we predicted uh, leaf temperature pattern when they are attacked by each species at this uh, air temperature that is leading to, uh, to a challenge for at least half of the species. And again, if you compute uh, the naive warming tolerance, uh, so here in blue, uh, you see that warming tolerance are uh, quite large for all the species. If I take an example here, this spider mite, spider mite sorry, is living at uh, 12 degrees uh, below its own thermal limit. So it's comfortable, there is, uh, there is a thermal safety margin there, as we call it. If instead of using air temperature, you, uh, you take intact leaf temperature, uh, more and more now uh, intact well, Leaf temperatures are available for, um, for most uh, tree species, especially in orchards or all uh, cultivated areas, thanks to remote sensing. Uh, it's increasing a lot now, this technology. And uh, one uh, might think that uh, intact leaf surface temperature may, uh, may actually make the job uh, to uh, predict, assess this warming tolerance. This is what you have here in green. And uh, you get something very different compared to the naive approach, of course with still a relatively comfortable warming tolerance for some of the species like the spider mite, but uh, some aphids are already deep into this range uh, that corresponds to thermal danger. But of course, the point here is that we need to consider really the macroclimatic temperatures, that's to say the temperature of the leaf when it is attacked by the herbivore. And this is what you get here in, in, in red. The first point is that uh, it's slightly different uh, compared to intact leaf temperature. And the point is, even if you still have a, a slightly positive warming tolerance for some of the species, for the most tolerant, uh, uh, and for others, it's already uh, slightly negative, but globally, it's uh, more or less two degrees for all of the species. And that was actually the surprise that we got is that the leaf microclimate is making all the species are relatively vulnerable uh, to heat waves and much more than what we expected before based on the atmospheric temperature here in blue. So that was uh, by using a, a sort of a mean leaf surface temperature. And so we wonder to what extent we can, uh, we can continue to go thinner and thinner and see what's happening at the uh, within leaf uh, scale of the system. We did that because when you measure uh, uh, using um, a thermal infrared camera, when you measure leaf surface temperature, you get this kind of patterns. And you see that some part of the leaves, especially when they are uh, exposed to full sun, some part of the leaves can be much warmer than others due to several mechanisms that uh, are well understood now. Uh, and you see that, uh, it's better there, you see that leaves that are in full sun can have a temperature range across their surfaces that is on average about seven degrees Celsius on apple in this uh, context. While in the shade, it's uh, barely more than two degrees uh, across the leaf surface. 
So this is an important temperature range, and we think that this, well, intuitively, we think that this might uh, help these uh, arthropods to thermoregulate at the surface of the leaf by moving uh, simply. Uh, so yeah, just a few words uh, about this uh, heterogeneity from where it comes from. Uh, there are several mechanisms, but uh, recently we really characterized uh, the importance of the leaf microtopography in generating this uh, heterogeneity of the leaf surface. And even uh, slight changes in the slope of the limbs or within each limb, uh, you have slight changes uh, between the veins, secondary veins of the, of the leaf system. <laughs> Even if the leaf looks quite flat uh, for your eyes, uh, there are uh, variations in slopes. And depending on the uh, orientation of the sun that is uh, sending a radiation beam uh, to, you, uh, to your surface, uh, depending on the orientation, is like exactly like the slope of mountains, you get very different temperature patterns. So we have, again, these biophysical models. Like before, uh, it's a heat budget of the leaf surface for each uh, small pa local part, let's say pixel of the leaf surface, and for which we also introduce a slope relationship compared to uh, the sun orientation. And you see that this microtopography here, for example, is actually explaining most of the uh, variation we see, uh, uh, we measured with the thermal camera uh, here at the leaf scale. And here's the simulation of the model. So the model is quite performant at predicting where the leaf is going to be warmer and where it is going to be colder, although the model uh, fails somehow to uh, predict the absolute value of the maximum temperature you can get at the leaf surface. But we are not sure if it's a problem of the model or if it's a problem of uh, measuring this heterogeneity with uh, the thermal camera. So these fine scale macroclimates are highly heterogeneous and we can explain that by mechanisms. And so we wonder if insects can use, can exploit this heterogeneity at the leaf uh, scale, uh, within the leaf scale. We did that uh, for several species. I'm just illustrating uh, rapidly for two of the species, main species, the uh, green apple aphid that you have here. Uh, so basically the protocol is to be under strictly control conditions. And then you have an infrared camera that follows uh, temperature distribution and a visible camera to follow the movement and position of the different uh, individuals. And basically what we found for the aphids is that no, they are not using this heterogeneity. They are not moving much actually at the leaf surface. Uh, why? Because we think there is a feeding constraint there. Uh, they need to feed on the phloem, so they need to be close to the beans. And then uh, they have this constraint that uh, is constraining their movement. What is important, however, is that we discover that these aphids are always living uh, at the warmest portion of the leaf uh, near the central vein, the primary vein. So we also did that on another species that is much more mobile, a priori, is a spider mite. And we did exactly the same, so I will not go into every detail here, but basically what we found is that these spider mites indeed are moving uh, when they are around their optimal conditions for development of the, of the juveniles. And it's about around 31 degrees. And so they use this heterogeneity to get close to the optimum temperature. I still have one minute to go, yeah. And by contrast, uh, we expected this heterogeneity to help the spider mite to survive at very high uh, extreme temperatures. And it's not the case because we discovered that warming the, uh, the air is inducing an uh, homogen homogenization of the leaf surface temperature, as you can see here uh, using the uh, thermal infrared images, for some reasons that are not entirely clear to us for the moment. So yeah, to, uh, to summarize a little bit what, about what I showed, I like to quote uh, what Michael Kaspari wrote about one of our paper, is that in a globally changing world, these insects act locally to survive. And that brings really this idea that even if we look at global scale for climate change, we have to pay attention to what is happening at very, very local and fine scale where our insects are living. And there, our, uh, the macroclimatic temperatures really are mandatory if we want to assess correctly the vulnerability to extreme events. 
And so these, uh, these uh, information have also consequences for macroecologists. And, and I like to talk to macroecologists as well because our studies are showing that macroclimate can cause a variation of about eight degrees uh, within a community at the interspecific level and about the same order of magnitude, seven degrees at the intraspecific level for the leaf miner. So if you put that as box plot, here you see that our box plot of thermal limit for our organisms, the, even if they are all warmer, higher than uh, what we can find for uh, what is known for all atropods at the same latitude, uh, the order of the magnitude uh, or amplitude, I should say, of variation is really similar uh, to what we find in the literature. So this means that we think macroclimate can actually be the key to explain the interspecific variation in thermal limit you can get at any point in space at the macroecological scale. And so macroecologists up to now uh, mostly are uh, contrasting or, uh, or deriving macroclimate conditions with thermal limits to get to a naive warming tolerance uh, predictions. And this can lead to uh, somehow erroneous uh, distribution shifts, uh, shift, especially at the warm boundary of the distribution. And what we are advocating for is to use not macroclimate, but microclimate conditions to get these well-informed warming tolerance and maybe get a more accurate distribution shift predictions. The problem here is that macroclimate temperature is not known for most of the species. And uh, of course, it seems quite difficult to put logger, especially very fine loggers uh, everywhere in the world. So here we think that biophysical model um, and, and you can think about niche mapper that has been uh, uh, produced by uh, Michael Kierney are really helpful to generate these uh, temperature pattern, macroclimatic temperature pattern that we miss uh, for most of the organisms. And the advantage of these uh, mechanistic approaches is that you can also uh, introduce behavior. Ready to, uh, to, to end up, to close this presentation, three take home messages. I hope I convince you that the centimeter scale may matter depending on the question, of course, but we still need to connect uh, very tightly with macroecologists, climatologists, meteorologists to uh, both downscale and upscale uh, the different processes uh, that we have. Uh, the dream actually is not to connect with um, uh, forest uh, scientists that are uh, producing wonderful papers about the forest macroclimate uh, that is really uh, in danger actually uh, under global change. And uh, of course, we are working at much thinner scale, but we are uh, looking at connecting these two, uh, two different scales. Mechanisms, mechanisms are so much important if you want to understand exactly what's happening. And uh, I hope my presentation also convinced you that these microclimatic effects can be quite subtle. And we need this kind of detailed thermal analysis, although it's a long, it takes a long time to, to, to drive them at fine scale. And uh, yes, they are urgently needed. And to finish, one important question that remains open actually is what is going to be the amplitude of microclimatic change? Uh, I presented the results under uh, heat wave event, but if you uh, look at the gradual increase in uh, temperature at the macroclimatic scale there, uh, we are facing many challenges, especially uh, related to the potential adaptation of the species. And I thank you for your patience and uh, all these people and from there uh, for all the work that has been done. Of course, I did not do uh, on my own and all these people uh, 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 contributed to this. Thank you. I'm sorry, I took a few minutes more than I was supposed to. Thank you so much for this uh, really interesting talk. And the idea now is that we hope to have some questions from the floor and some questions from the people who are watching us online. So do we have any questions? Yeah. Thank 
Hi, thank you very much. It's very interesting. I'm particularly interested in what you're saying about looking at the kind of demography of the three D and the temperature. Um, I'm, I'm interested in whether you've been looking at how that's affected by the interaction with the medical systems. I'm thinking about things like if you have leaf plants and then that's stacking. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the same conceptual approach than what we did with this transpiration. Um, the first, as a first step in this model, we have uh, the microtopography of intact leaves. And uh, for sure, especially spadomites and yeah, the leaf miner, which is interesting, like a, uh, how you call that, a bundling, uh, tentiform uh, shape of the, of the stuff. So changing the microtopography of the leaf surface. It's something that we still need to introduce into the, into the model. Uh, well, we have to scan uh, again all these leaves, so it's, uh, it's going to be another work again. But uh, yeah, sure, it's going to, to have an effect on this, uh, on this distribution. Thank you. So we have, I don't know, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah? can you hear me? Yeah, it's working, <laughs> excellent. And we have an online question. Um, how do you measure temperature within a leaf mine? Within a leaf mine, yeah. We have, uh, I'm using uh, a lot, a lot, a lot uh, thermocouples, uh, very fine thermocouples. Uh, it can be type T or type K, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, they are very fine, and the one we are using are 0 0.2 millimeters in diameter at the end of the thermocouple, and you can very easily introduce them in very small spaces. And for the, for the mine system, uh, the story is that initially what we did is we uh, put the thermocouple across the lower uh, integument where the stomata are. And at the very beginning of the project, uh, we didn't know that stomata were still functional. And when we discovered that stomata were functional, functional and responding to, uh, to environmental condition, we realized that crossing this segment with the thermocouple, uh, of course, destroy uh, the, the, the functioning of the system. So we change the way the methodology, and instead we uh, put the thermocouple across a feeding window, which is more like inert into the system, and we put a drop of a small drop of oil, digital oil, to uh, isolate uh, the hole that we inevitably make uh, when you cross the feeding window. And it worked pretty well in the end. For field, I haven't shown that, but we did that also uh, on, in the field. And uh, of course, uh, when it's quite windy, etc., the thermocouple can be uh, can get out of the mine system. But it did, it did work uh, relatively well, well enough, I would say, to measure temperature within the mine. Yeah. So it's a fascinating journey into the biotiary of microclimates. There's not so much of that, but only when we show the graph of the leaf surface that varies by 20 degrees in the leaf surface temperature. If it's microclimate adapted, it's not to say that the leaf we showed. What was the variation under the leaf? And does the microclimate measure? So, you, uh, not, sure, not sure I understood, but you mean temperature uh, underside versus upper side of the leaf? Huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, we are lucky because in the upper system, the leaf is thin enough so that the temperature you get at the underside is very close to the temperature you get at the upper side of, of the leaf. And it was a bit different for the mine because the mine is inducing. Uh, you can see that as a bubble of air into the leaf tissues. And there you get a small difference between the upper side of the mine and the lower side of the mine. It's about two and a half degrees Celsius, the difference. And this magnitude is actually uh, depends on the amount of radiations more, more than on the air temperature. But for intact leaf tissues and uh, leaf tissues that are attacked by uh, externally by all these herbivores at the community scale, we get very similar uh, within 0 0.5 degrees Celsius between the two sides of the leaf. It can be very different from for other plant species, right? But if you get a thicker, uh, a thicker uh, 
higher thickness of the leaf tissues, then you may have larger differences in temperature between the two sides. My second question still relates to that, really. Um, so the thermal properties of the leaf tissues are very different from the so you, uh, I can't hear you very well, actually. I'm sorry. So you mean uh, the uh, properties uh, horizontally versus uh, across the thickness of the of the leaf? No. So the temperature cycles every 24 hours uh, on the surface of the leaf uh, by times degrees. Um, so you can see that there is a large scale variation. Yeah. How do you capture that variation in your biophysical model? Yeah, well, basically you can do anything you, you want with the biophysical model. It's just, it's just, it's just a matter of how you feed them uh, precisely. So you can use the model to, uh, to get uh, predictions over a cycle of 24 hours. Uh, you can introduce in, you can run the model at a one minute time step or one hour or whatever. It doesn't, I mean, it's the same. Uh, it's just depend on the, on the input data that you, you can have. Uh, so if you do measurements in the field at one minute scale, you can feed your model with these uh, climatic conditions and we create these uh, dynamic across time. Um, what we still need to do is uh, to have, uh, so we have this biophysical model that allows us to compute, let's say mean surface temperature. And we have this biophysical model that allows us to compute the heterogeneity uh, in temperature across the surface. We now need to, uh, to cross each other into a single model to create and to generate predictions of uh, within leaf heterogeneity across time uh, and to get predictions uh, in, the, in this dynamic. What we think is that night time temperatures uh, are uh, waiting uh, uh, much more than daytime temperatures because during the night, uh, everything is homogeneous, basically. Uh, leaf temperature will, uh, will reach uh, a certain temperature and will not change much. And that temperature will happen for like eight, nine, 10 hours, depending on the season, etc. While during the day, there is much more variation occurring at a high frequency over much smaller uh, temporal scales, and such that the maximum temperature that are supposedly the more challenging uh, for the species will happen during only one hour, one hour and a half. So in terms of survival, what is going on during daytime is important, but in terms of, of uh, uh, rate of development, for example, and performance, uh, nighttime temperature may actually wait much more than uh, diurnal temperatures. I'm not sure I understood. I, uh, I uh, responded to the question in particular. I slightly derived, but anyway. Thanks very much. Um, if we could just give Sylvain another thank you, and then I have a thank you.